the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Marshall. Mr. Rudyard Kipling used to say, the toad beneath the harrow knows exactly where each tooth point goes. The butterfly upon the road preaches contentment to that toad. It's remarkable, isn't it, how other people's sorrows are always so bearable. Other people's sorrows. What would we do without them occasionally? But Rudy, they'll kill me. They wouldn't dare. For the kind of money I owe them, they'll dare anything. You've got to help me. All right, I will help you. Will you give me the money, then? I'll help you to help yourself. How? We'll go to the police. No, it's the only way. How long do you think I'll live afterwards? Our mystery drama, Shark Bait was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tony Roberts. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Who was it that said, we can forgive our friends anything except success? No point moralizing about it. It's completely human, and therefore quite normal and natural. However, like everything else, it can be carried to extremes. Randolph Watson is having breakfast with his Aunt Ethel. Have some kippers, Randolph. Kippers? Very tasty. Very salty. Nonsense. My doctor says that... How old is this doctor of yours? No, I'd say he's about 40. Well, I'm 81. Well, what has that got to do with... I'm twice as old as he is. I've been around twice as long. Really? Therefore, I know twice as much. Yes, Aunt Ethel. Oh, don't give me that martyred eye. Just to say I've got the humor that's crazy old dame. How much longer can she live? Oh, why must you persist? Then I'll have all her money. I will live a long, long time because I do not listen to doctors. Now, if you would just eat a hearty breakfast... Oh, please, Aunt Ethel. I just want some coffee. Oh, Randolph, you always were a picky eater. That's your trouble. Now, when you were just children, you and your brother Rudolph, I knew from the start which one of you would be a success. Go on, ask me how I knew. You told me at least... I knew because Rudolph had gusto. He did everything with gusto. He would eat with gusto. Yes, Adam. He is what my grandfather would call a two-handed trencherman. Now, you show me another fellow who sits down to the table, tucks his napkin under his chin, rubs his hands, smacks his lips, picks up his knife and fork, and gets to work. Yes, I know, Adam. Oh, I know. Oh, yes, indeed. He eats his plate. <laughs> now, think of a hoot in a rain barrel for calories. Cholesterol, vitamins, minerals, carbohydrates. Uh, may I, uh, may I be excused, Aunt Ethel? I, I have an appointment. With a young lady, I hope. At eight in the morning? Well, why not? Why not? Well, that's what you need, Randolph. A handsome young woman. A high-spirited relative. Aunt uh, Ethel, I have a business appointment. Indeed. And who proposes to swindle you this time? Oh, now... What I... oceanfront property is for sale in Iowa? You have no right... As for the four bridges that span the East River in New York, they are municipal property and therefore not subject to sale. Oh, this is monstrous of you. Aunt Ethel, I'm meeting about a solid, sound, and substantial proposition. All of them were, Randolph. This investment is surprisingly small. The answer is no. But... Aunt if I give you any substantial sums of money while I am alive, I shall only impoverish both of us. You must wait until I am decently dead. Then you can speedily squander every last penny. But look at all the money you gave Rudolph. And look how constructively he has employed it. Everything Rudolph touches turns to gold. Now, oh, Rudolph, Rudolph, all I hear is Rudolph. You will have to get by on your allowance. But I can't live on my... You could always get a job, you know. Well... 
that wouldn't be fair. Oh, then why not? Oh, well, don't you see? I shall one day come into a fortune. Now, that's true, isn't it? Oh, where is all this taking us, Randolph? Well, I won't need the money I earn, and therefore I, I should be depriving someone who does of the opportunity. Well, deprive him. Oh, but, Aunt Ethel, this particular proposition... No. I really need the money. You have an allowance. Allowance? A child has an allowance. Of course. I'm in debt. I shouldn't be surprised. And, and these people, they, they want their money. They have every right to be paid. You don't understand. What is there to understand? You have debts, and therefore you have debtors. But you have a source of income, an allowance. Sit down with these people and work out a reasonable solution. Oh, but these are not reasonable people. Then you should have had nothing to do with them in the first place. And that will have to be my final word on the subject. That's my Aunt Ethel. A hateful, horrid woman. Doesn't she understand it cannot be her final word? Has she never met people like Louis? Of course not. How could she? Louis and his kind form part of a subculture. A man of few words, but each is measured and oh, so meaningful. Uh, I, I came as soon as I got your message. The dough. Well, there's, uh, there's a difficulty. Bad. I don't have it. Worse. Maybe we could arrange something. Wait. And with that, he walked away from the bar. I say walked, perhaps, but that's not the right word. I should say prowled. Or no, paced. Yes, paced. You know, with that nervous tread that characterizes the movement of a bear. A huge Alaskan brown bear. One of the most fearsome animals alive. He went to make a telephone call. Within a minute or two, he was back. I tried to read his face, but nothing was written on it. Or perhaps everything was written on it. Let's go. Let's go? Uh, well, where? The boss. The boss? Uh, what do you mean, uh, the boss? The boss. The boss. It had an ominous ring to it. I knew I was in the hands of questionable gentlemen, but the boss. Visions of beady-eyed, tight-lipped, paunchy people in expensive but vulgar suits who dispensed rough justice flashed through my brain. However, Louis conducted me to a somewhat nondescript commercial building. There, in a small, plainly furnished office, sat a young lady with long blonde hair, deep blue eyes, who looked for all the world like the queen of the homecoming game at an Ivy League college. How do you do? Is this Mr. Randolph Watson, Louis? Yeah, boss. Boss? You are the boss? <laughs> Male chauvinism. It survives to the very end, doesn't it? Ah, uh, well... It remains when all else is gone. Money, resources... Hope, even when one is reduced to the breath in one's body. I, I meant no... Uh... I have problems enough with my associates. I do not require additional ones from my clients. I assure you, uh, I intend to present you with no problem. But you have. A $50,000 problem. I only borrowed 30 Interest, my friend. Interest. 50000 The entire sum due and payable... Today. Well, I don't have 50000 I, I don't. Obviously. Which is why we are engaged in this discussion. 50000 uh, Look, I'll pay it somehow. Yes? I, um, I'll get the money. May I inquire where? Oh, look, don't press me. Indeed. Yes, and don't give me indeed. After all, I, I don't have to pay you back. <laughs> what a fantastic statement. How do you intend to justify that point of view? Well, it's a gambling debt, isn't it? Of course. Well, therefore, uh, it's not legal. <laughs> ah, you have a point. See? You admit it. I also have a point. He's standing right beside you. His name is Louis. Louis, this gentleman thinks he is not obligated to pay what he owes us. Yeah? Oh. It was a single, one-syllable word. It was spoken quietly, which is perhaps why the noise of it almost shattered my eardrums. I looked into Louis's eyes. I saw my fate. 
My bullet-riddled body, encased in cement, sinking slowly, disappearing into the silt of the harbor, I hastened to assure the boss that I was an extremely reasonable person. The issue before us here is not your reasonableness, but your financial position. My aunt refuses to give me any more money. Ah. Well, you have a brother. Ah, yes. I do have a brother. A twin brother. Rudolph. Rudolph and Randolph. The Watson twins. Rudolph. Oh, yes. Rudolph. The robust one. The handsome one. The talented one. But only I knew his true nature. I'll tempt him with his royal halberdier. You know, it's the oldest fly in the world. Uh, Rudy. They say it was first tied by Bonnie Prince Charlie himself as he fished for salmon in his favorite Highland Street. Yes, Rudy. Uh, why aren't you fishing, Randy? Oh, bother fishing. You can buy the finest fish there is without getting your feet wet and your clothes smelly. Oh, got him. I booked him there. Oh, he, he must be ten pounds of his mouth. Does he work all that exertion? Just wait till we dine on him Friday night in Ant Oh, please, you're making me ill. Ah, I got you, my fine beauty. Got you. Ah, yes. Properly spiced, prettily garnished. Oh, what a feast is in store. Rudy, I need $50,000. Well, last month you needed $25,000. It's the same money. Oh? Uh-huh. Did you borrow more? No, it's just the way that they figure the interest. Well, that sounds... You sure is? Um, it probably is. Well, then it's, it's illegal. Well, I don't deny it, Rudy. Well, you must report it to the district attorney. I don't need advice, Rudy. I need money. Well, I don't have any. You don't have any? I don't have any for gangsters and gamblers and, and loan sharks. But those people will kill me, Rudy. Well, they shall do no such thing. How can you say that? Because I shall go to the district attorney. They'll kill you, too. Well, I shan't permit any hoodlum to push my brother around. But but the money means nothing to you. In the immortal words of Charles Goodlow Harper, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. saw the whole thing. My brother had just suggested how I could pay off the boss and have a fortune for myself besides. Of course, someone would have to die. But as long as that someone wouldn't be me, what difference would it make in the cosmic scheme of things? Who can answer such a question? Who really knows anything at all about the cosmic scheme of things? Or indeed, if such a scheme even exists. Well, it appears that we are dealing with the oldest of all recorded crimes. Fratricide. Or the prospect of it, at any rate. We'll see how things go when I return shortly with Act Two. To all intents and purposes, What some of the extremist Jacobins of the French Revolution seemed to be saying was, be my brother, or I'll kill you. And here, several centuries later, we have Randolph Watson reversing the situation. What Randolph seems to be saying, as far as his twin Rudolph is concerned, is, because you're my brother, I shall kill you. Dangerous times. Dangerous times indeed. Randy, I say go to the police. It's your duty as a citizen. And what about your duty to help your brother? I am helping you, but in the right way. Well, the simplest way would be for you to write me a check. Then I would be an accessory. Accessory to what? I would be helping to nourish the lawlessness that flourishes all around us. No, no. If you refuse to go to the police, then I shall. Ah, yes. The plan was taking shape. He would go to the police today when he returned to the city. Then, four nights later, on Friday, we would be at Aunt Ethel's for dinner, for one of those atrocious gourmet meals which Rudy insisted on preparing. Oh, it's you. Yes. May I come in, boss? You said you wished to go home in order to review your options. Yes. I've worked out a plan which shall enable me to discharge my debt. In full? 
In fall. When? Soon. Soon is a rather vague and uncertain concept. Oh, I expect a particular event to transpire this coming Friday night. What sort of event? Uh, let us say one that shall mark a dramatic upturn in my fortunes. Hopefully. I must say, however, that our mutual friend, Louis, is becoming somewhat restive. Well, you can get him to wait until Friday night, can't you? Barely, Mr. Watson. Just barely. I may have to call on you for some assistance. That's what we're here for, Mr. Watson. I intend to commit murder. That is a rather risky undertaking. Well, if I can eliminate my aunt and my brother... But won't you be suspected? Well, not if I succeed in throwing enough suspicion on my brother. Continue. I need some poison. Now, uh, how could I, as a law-abiding citizen, obtain poison without arousing suspicion? When and how do you plan to use it? At dinner, Friday night. Rudolf is preparing it. How do you intend to feed the poison to the right people? Well, it has to do with my knowledge of everyone's eating habits. Yes? Uh, Mr. Randolph Watson. Uh, who wishes to know? I'm Detective Lieutenant Ferret. Ferret? You are Mr. Watson? May I come in? Ferret? The most appropriate name for a detective. What may I do for you, Lieutenant Ferret? Uh, you can tell us who's trying to shake you down. I beg your pardon? I'm sure you know what I mean. I haven't the foggiest notion. Mr. Watson, your police department is trying to help you. <laughs> help me to do what? Help you to, well, I guess you could say, extricate yourself from this position you're in. To what position do you refer? Uh, we are wasting time. Now, you know you're into the sharks. You'll never be able to swim home free unless we help you. Are you sure you want me, Randolph Watson? There isn't some mistake? Oh, there's no mistake. He said you'd deny it at first. Who said I would deny what at first? Your brother, Mr. Rudolph Watson. Well, where does my brother enter into this? He came down to headquarters. He said his brother, that's you, was in the clutches of some loan sharks. He said that? I am giving you his exact words. But it, it isn't true. If it isn't true, why should he say it? I don't know. Now, look, Mr. Watson. Why would your brother come to us with such a story? I, I said I, I, I don't know. Well, I've got an idea you do know. Now, tell us what's happening. I can't. Why not? Well, I have to protect my brother. The people who can protect you or your brother are the police. He's in trouble. Your brother, Rudolph? Yes. Well, you better, you better tell us what it is. Yes, yes, yes. Perhaps that would be best. You see, Lieutenant, uh, he, um, uh, Rudy, is the one who's in the clutches of the loan shop. Uh, now, wait a minute. No, it's true. Well, why would he come to us and say that you well, were... Because perhaps he was too frightened to do it for himself. Yeah? Do you ever read the advice to the Lovelorn columns, Lieutenant? Uh, no. Oh, you should. It's a fascinating sociological commentary. What does this have to do with what a I... A typical I... letter usually begins, uh, A friend of mine is having trouble with her husband. Or, I have a friend who is in a terrible situation. Do you see? Uh, do I see what? Oh, it isn't the friend. It's the person who's writing the letter. Everyone hides behind another identity. It's what Freud calls transference. What are you trying to tell me, Mr. Watson? That your brother is actually in trouble with some gangsters, but insists that you're the one who is? Exactly. <laughs> but why? I told you why. It's the same reason people write their love loan letter claiming they're doing it for a friend. No one wants to admit that he could be foolish enough to get into such a terrible situation to begin with. So, uh, it's your brother, uh... Yes, Lieutenant. And we must help him. Do you know who the sharks are? No. No, this is the first I've ever heard of it. 
And does your brother have any uh, money problems? None that I know of. But... But what? Oh, he has so many deals going on at the same time. Has he seemed nervous or worried lately? Well, now that you mention it, uh... Ah, he has been worried. I'm sure of it. Worried about what? Money. Uh, well, from what I hear, he's a rich man. Well, you can be rich, but you can still be hard up for cash. Sometimes you need a great deal of cash. And you're forced to convert certain holdings uh, at the wrong time at a considerable loss. Oh, and uh, that's the spot your brother is in? Lieutenant, he must be in terrible trouble. If he's been to the loan sharks, then... Then it means that... What? Oh, what does it mean? It means that she turned him down. Who turned him down? Aunt Ethel. Yeah. Yes, it has to be something very bad, because he's the favorite, you see. He always was. He could always get anything he wanted from Aunt Ethel. And now I'm worried. I'm really worried. Well, see if you can get him to talk to you. Yes, I will. It may take a while, but I'm sure he'll talk. His going to the police and saying that I was in trouble is his way of asking for help. Here's my card. It has my telephone number. Call me as soon as you know anything. Any time at all. Yes, Mr. Watson? Uh, at your suggestion, I went to see my brother. Was he willing to help you? Uh, well, he was willing to tell me how to help myself. What did he suggest? That I go to the police. And? Oh, naturally, I refused. Naturally. However, he went to the police. And? The police came to see me. And you said to them? I said it was a ploy on his part. A ploy? Yes, a psychological ploy. For what reason? He was the one who owed the money. Oh. It would be good for me if the police could be completely convinced of that. How would that be good for me? It would set in motion a chain of events that could enable me to pay off my debt. What is it you want me to do? It would require the services of Louis. My brother Rudolph, the master fisherman. He had no way of knowing or even suspecting, but he was about to become a fish himself. He was lunching at his club, as usual, the following afternoon. <laughs> Suddenly, a tall, heavy man entered. You. Uh, I beg your pardon. Listen. What do you want? Pay up. I beg your pardon. What are you talking about? This. Did you see that? Oh, you want it? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yes. This tall, heavy, unidentified man knocked my brother sprawling to the floor and then quickly left. I say he was unidentified. I could identify him as Louis. But of course I won't. Inspector Ferret seemed quite concerned. Uh, there's no doubt about it now. He is in debt to the sharks. It happened in front of at least 20 witnesses at his club. But couldn't anyone do anything? Well, it happened so quickly. Did the assailant say anything? Oh, yes. At least 10 people heard him. It was a warning to pay up. Oh, well, when you faced him with it, what did my brother say? He said it was a case of uh, mistaken identity. Oh. He claims the hoodlum mistook him for you. Hmm. Won't he identify the uh, hooligan? He claims he doesn't know who the man is. Well, we're having dinner with my aunt this evening. Perhaps I can talk the whole thing out. Well, the police actually think I'm the one who's in debt. Well, why should they think that? Who knows? Some detective with the unbelievable name of Ferret came by to see me. <laughs> Ferret? You're joking. Now, look here. Why don't you tell them that you're the one who's in a jam? Oh, how long do you think I'd live after I made such a statement and then proceeded to identify the uh, sharks? <laughs> if you'd have given me the money when I asked you to... Uh, Randy, that fellow, he, he was like a mean, growling bear. I have an idea. This could be serious. Well, that's what I told you. <laughs> that fellow had the two of us confused. It could be serious for me, too. That is, if you don't pay up. Now, now I, I, I'll tell you what I'm willing to do. After we've had dinner with Aunt Ethel this evening, I might work out a way to lend you that 50000 well, What do you say? 
What a difference a day makes from the popular song of the same name some years ago. Yesterday, I would have leaped for joy. I would have laughed and cried and danced on the ceiling. I would have shouted, saved, I'm saved. But that was yesterday. Today was another day. Today, I had a new plan. A bright, brilliant, beautiful plan in operation. Today, I was playing for higher stakes. I was no longer interested in paying a picayune $50,000 debt to some small-time hoodlums. Today, I was about to become one of the richest men in America. Two people would have to die before that could happen, but I knew how to bring that about easily enough. And so, I turned to Rudolph and I said, What do I say, Rudy? I say, no, thank you. You mean, you don't need the $50,000? No, Rudy, I don't need the $50,000. Well, I offered. Yes, Rudolph, you did offer. Thank goodness the offer was turned down. We came very close to not having a third act. Because if Randolph had accepted Rudolph's offer of the money... Our drama would have to be over then and there. The boys would arrive at Aunt Uncle's, have dinner, and that would be that. But now we're going to have our murder. And right in the place that's been set aside for it, in Act Three, which I shall bring you shortly. Who was it that said, Subdue your appetite, and you've conquered human nature? But the problem is that human nature demands of us that we satisfy our appetites. And what does satisfy mean? It's a highly troublesome situation. And in the next 15 minutes or so, we're about to see some appetites in action. However, let it be said here at the outset that none of them will be subdued exactly. Oh, what splendid salmon, Rudolph. Yes, Aunt Ethel. I thought you'd like to see them before I exert my usual culinary magic. You didn't catch any, did you, Randall? I cannot claim fishing as a talent. <laughs> Indeed. And what talent, if any, can you claim? Patience, Aunt Ethel. Patience. Well, shall I go into the kitchen and begin? Yes, Rudolph. But please be careful of poor skewer's feelings. <laughs> I should explain. Uh, Aunt Ethel has a chef. His name is Skewers. He's a fantastically jealous person. He looks upon these weekly dinners that Rudy prepares as an invasion of his culinary province. I have him in reserve as a second-line suspect, if he's needed. He generally grumbles and sulks while Rudy usurps the kitchen. Skewers! What are you doing out here? Hey, what am I doing out here? <laughs> why aren't you in the kitchen? You know why. I have been evicted. That's why. Don't you know what night this is? Friday. Ah, yes, Friday. And that, that amateur, your brother, is in the kitchen. Well, you must admit he is a rather good cook. Cook? <laughs> That's exactly what he is. A cook. That's what Maxime, an amateur, a chef, is a professional. <laughs> you know what that means. See, the top. The best. You're right. You're right. He is an amateur. He's gifted, but an amateur for all that. She has no right to foist him on you. <laughs> what can I do? She pays the bills. She's the boss. You know, uh, Skewers, I too am an amateur. And a gifted one, too. Uh, yeah? No. Oh, yes. I happen to play the bassoon. I didn't know that. Well, it's always been my fondest dream to play with the city symphony. I used to ask my aunt to arrange it. How could she arrange it? She owns the city symphony orchestra. Uh, how could she own... She's the wealthiest patron. She practically supports it. One word from her and the conductor wouldn't dare to refuse to let me sit in. But when I asked her, do you know what she said to me? Go ahead. Go ahead. Ask me what she said. What did she say? She said she would not foist an amateur on Mr. Kuzelovsky. That's what she said? Yes. But... She doesn't hesitate to voice the amateur on you. That's right. That's right. It's because she has no respect for you. Yes, yes. In all fairness, I play bassoon better than Rudolph Cook. <laughs> we'll see about that. And with all due respect, she's an old lady. There must be the utmost skill and care in the preparation of her food. Suppose, suppose she gets sick. <laughs> 
helped him work up a fine head of steam and pointed him toward my Aunt Ethel. Uh, you could hear the fireworks all over the house. All the other servants simply stood silent in shocked surprise. They'd remember this later when the police would ask questions. I have been banished to throw down. Nonsense, Stuart. And your nephew, Randolph, is a better bassoon player. What are you saying? Yes, I notice you don't let him play in the kitchen. Now, now see here, Stuart. I am going to speak my piece and have my say. I want respect. But I do give you respect, Stuart. Rudolph does not know how to cook. Oh, now, Rudolph is a splendid cook. He's an amateur. What if you get sick, huh? Sick? You know how easy it is to get sick from bad food. You see it? I will not put up with this, this shouting. Don't say I didn't warn you. Oh, yes. Perfect. Perfect. Everyone heard him threaten. It was exactly what I needed. And now, to effectuate the plan, I had in my pocket a small vial of tiny white crystals the boss had sold me. They looked like ordinary table salt. I placed a liberal quantity in the ornate sterling silver salt cellar. These crystals were called aronite, perhaps one of the most lethal forms of the deadly poison strychnine. Just a few would be enough to cause instant death. Now there was nothing to do except wait for the meal to begin. Oh, how I do enjoy these Fridays. I don't see enough of my nephew somehow. What's for dinner, Rudy? For your dining pleasure this evening, madame, we have, as the French might say, a la poached salmon. Ah. With the fine herb. Oh, and my. the sauce in an air de matante, la sauce effet. Oh, marvelous. <laughs> mm, it's a good fresh fish. Did it need all this fuss? Barbarian. Oh, it could have been simply boiled or broiled. Randy. Or baked. Oh, where have I gone wrong? I wonder. I tried to raise both of you in a civilized manner. I believe our dinner is even now at the peak. It must be eaten at once. Sooner or later, both of them would ask for the salt. And this would be their undoing. For in that silver salt cellar was poison enough to kill a battalion. Yes, my aunt would be dead. And Rudy would be blamed. If he died too, well... Something went wrong with his plan. Or I had skewers to take up the slack. Skewers, temporarily deranged, had done it. In any event, I was in the clear. I didn't prepare the food. I had no opportunity. I stood to inherit my aunt's estate, my brother's estate. A perfect crime. I was too nervous to eat. I could only sit there and watch and wait. Oh, this is Oh, thank you, Aunt Ethel. I didn't think it possible, Rudy, but you have actually surpassed yourself this time. What do you think, Randolph? Oh, don't ask him. He hasn't touched a bite. Why not, Randolph? Oh, for the best of all reasons. I'm not hungry. Oh, you're never hungry. Well, it's a matter of taste. You know, I think the salmon wants just a suggestion of pepper. Hmm, perhaps. Uh, pass the pepper, please, Randolph. The, um, pepper? Well, I believe that's what I said. You sure you don't want the salt? Salt? Oh, I don't know. What do you think, Rudolph? Well, I don't know either. Uh, thank you, Randolph. Just a thick stone of pepper. Or does the pepper do anything to it? Mm. Well, no, it needs just a suggestion of salt. Here. Here's the salt, Aunt Ethel. Hmm. Now, just after a little bit of salt. Oh! Oh! Beautiful perfection. <laughs> well, I'll just uh, try a shake of this myself. Would you pass the salt, please, Randy? Oh, with pleasure. Thank you. Was I right, Rudolph? Ah, uh, yes, this is now exactly right. Mr. <laughs> Salmon, as the Lord intended him to be eaten. <laughs> Why don't you try it, Randy? What for dessert, Rudolph? Oh, dessert? Uh-huh. Well, I had a problem. It does need just a little bit more salt. Uh, Randolph, who would you pass? Oh, of course. I, uh, I'll just try another slight shake myself. Here you are, Rudy. Thank you. Uh, you were about to tell me that's a dessert, Rudolph. Oh, yes. Well, I couldn't decide between... Crepe Suzette. Oh, my goodness. Cherry's Jubilee or Bake the Lamp. Oh, paradise. So, do you know what I did? You prepared all three. Uh, you peaked. 
That isn't fair. <laughs> All is fair in love, war, and food. Love, war, and food. Do you know something? <laughs> ah, that's what this world is all about, isn't it? I would say so. What do you think, Randolph? Randolph? What do I think? I don't know what to think. What can I think? Why aren't you dead? The two of you. You took enough poison from that shaker. More than enough. You should both be dead. I put the poison the boss gave me into that shaker. I know I did. Why aren't you both dead? Are you all right, Randolph? Uh, yes. Yes, I... I... Uh, something's wrong with him, and all. He's undernourished. You should eat something, Randy. I don't want anything. Oh, come on now, Randy. Salmon. A nice, wholesome fish. Just try a little bit. I'm not hungry. Now, you were there when I caught it. Just have a little. It's good for you. Lots of protein. That's exactly what he needs. Something to sustain him. Here, let me cut you just a small slice. A tiny piece. Oh, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> now, there. Now, just get some good, hot, delicious food inside your stomach. It'll make a new man of you. Uh, didn't I tell you? <laughs> Doesn't that taste just great? Really? Really? What is it? My throat. Something's wrong with him. My chest. I, I can't breathe. Really, get a doctor. Uh, Oh. The room was rocking, just as if I were on a ship at sea. And then I, I was at sea, and in the sea, being tossed from wave to wave, then a huge, dark shadow approached. I saw a long and terrible teeth. <laughs> Did I hear my brother's voice? Hey, Randy, tell me, Randy, what do you think I do? How do you think I make all my money? It was my brother's voice. But it was coming from the mouth of the great white shark. This is how I make my money, Randy. I set you up, Randy. <laughs> I set you up. The teeth. The terrible, tearing teeth of the shark. The shark is my brother. Uh, how's your aunt? Upstairs, in a state of shock. She doesn't remember anything? Well, the doctor says... She probably doesn't want to. She probably never will. Mm. What did happen? Well, you didn't believe me, Lieutenant, when I said I was talking about my brother. You thought I was the one in trouble, but... Oh, dear, he was desperate. Actually, what happened? Well, somehow, he succeeded in poisoning a piece of the fish. He figured, since I prepared it, I would be blamed. I would be found guilty of my aunt's death. And he would inherit from both of us. But how did he figure he could get her to eat the poison pea? Well, the plan must have misfired somehow. He wound up eating the poison fish himself. Hello, Rudy, baby. Hello, boss. There's only one boss in this thriving organization, and that's you. Uh-huh. And the reason the outfit is thriving is because no one but you... No, it's mine. I heard it all on the news. It went beautifully. Now, what kind of crystals did you give my brother? Uh, just salt. Ordinary salt. <laughs> you should have seen his eyes when Aunt Ethel and I sprinkled the salt from the shaker. <laughs> How did you manage to slip him the poison fish? Well, I had the serving platter, and earlier in the kitchen, I made sure there was plenty of that aeronite on that one small end piece. So now you are the only one to inherit Aunt Ethel when she dies. As long as your brother was the fall guy, why didn't you get rid of Aunt Ethel also? Oh, I couldn't do that. Why not? Well, for one thing, she's the only one who really enjoys it. Which is as good a reason as any. After all, cooking is an art. As a matter of fact, as the great master cook of all time, the Shibuya Tavara said, anyone can be a roaster of meat. But only an artist can hope to be a cook. Well, I've cooked up one or two things we can discuss shortly. Several hundred years ago, an astute gentleman named Mr. John Taylor said, God sends meat, the devil sends cooks. And he followed it up by also saying, God sends wealth, the devil creates debt. However, we can all realize a little profit here. After 
law, we have taken a bit of cookery, mixed it with a dab of indebtedness, and created ourselves an hour's entertainment. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Joan Shea, Lloyd Batista, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.